Hello everyone, we are back with another episode of our Visual Developers Conference in Mauritius. And Adija, who is our next guest? So our next guest is Dylan Haber, head of the head of engineering at uh, Ringia, South Africa. And he's going to tell you how do you is a job in the, a developer job interview. So right. tune in, make sure to watch it closely because <laughs> maybe that's how you get your next job. All right, then uh, welcome, Dylan, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What 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 is it? You have an office here in Mauritius as well, and also thank you so much for being a partner and supporter of the conference and our community activities. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it's so good to be with you with the with the Mauritius software development community. Um, like you said, we do have a, a, a an office in Mauritius. We're actually primarily based in South Africa. That's why South Africa is in our name. Um, but mm -hmm. our second biggest office that we have is in Mauritius. Um, and I'll have a, a, a few photos in the presentation of of some of the team there. So I was really hoping that this would be the 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 final excuse that I needed to get over to your island um, to be able to present at this conference and and meet the rest of the team in person that I haven't met um, and actually get my own photo on the Mauritius beaches. Um, but unfortunately, COVID has let us down again and uh, we're gonna have to do this remote. So I'll save that trip for another day, but I'm very keen to see uh, what the island has to offer and to, to actually see this uh, development community in person. No worries. I mean, next year's conference is already in the planning, in the making. Um, there might be good chances. We just need to wait how um, government is going to go forward with the um, regulation for the borders. Speaking of the pandemic, what's the current situation in South Africa? Is it flattening? Is it still serious? What yeah, so we're, we're still... We're still in a serious position. Um, I think mm. things have improved. Our recovery rate has increased quite significantly um, within the country, but we're we're not down to zero. Um, I think Mauritius got there way faster than than most countries did. So congratulations to everyone on your side for actually following the rules and and getting processes in place that worked. Um, but our borders are still locked down. So even if I if your borders were open, I wouldn't be able to leave. Um, and when we we still have quite quite a few restrictions during our lockdown processes at the moment. Um, but mm -hmm. overall, uh, the country's in in not a terrible position. Um, we, we're definitely on on the improvement process, and things are looking a lot better than they were a couple of months ago. Oh yeah, that's that's great. I mean, that's great to hear. And I mean, especially in in African countries, it might be quite difficult compared to other areas in in regards to supplies, uh, hygiene, and and um, water supply i mean i also uh, got the impression that uh, you guys struggling a little bit with the load shedding that you suddenly poof, power gone for i don't know half a day yes a day. well unfortunately we've had some some issues over the last couple of years with the generation of electricity in south africa and that mm. has directly affected a lot of the businesses and a lot of the tech teams um, so we've got, some of us have have backup processes in place. I have a, an inverter here in case the power does cut. But if yep. it does drop, it's normally on a schedule because it's 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 a, some type of a re reduction in generation ability. And then they put mm. people on schedule schedules and drop you for about an hour and a half to two and a half hours, three hours a, a, for a specific time period. Um, okay. So it's, it's not ideal for the tech space. It's, it really um, makes, especially working remotely, quite difficult. And it's one of the, the serious challenges that South Africa does need to address and, and sort out um, because it is going to limit the growth that we can have as a, a tech team, as a tech um, industry. And I mean, every industry is affected, but directly, if you're working on, on um, computers, on internet yeah. processes, on, on the web, that directly affects uh, everything that you're doing in, in, a, in a very fundamental way. There's nothing that we can really do offline. So I do hope that that does get addressed in the next couple of, of years and they, they get to stabilize it. Um, but if not, we will We'll make a plan like we always do. <laughs> we'll we'll find our own solutions and we'll make sure that we stay online for, for the important bits at least. Well, I mean, similar what you have for the electricity, I think, Adija, what is our water situation from time to time? <laughs> let's, let's move on. <laughs> Tell us what are the ups and downs during a developer job interview? What is your advice to, to the audience? And... Um, I'm I'm excited and uh, very interested to to get some inspirations because even as a company owner, it's always interesting to learn from others about the right questions to ask to candidates. 
Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll trust that you're going to keep me honest during this process. And at the end of it, tell me if I'm, if I'm lying to everybody, because you've clearly been on the other side of this process as well. But yes, that sounds great. Let me, let me get into it and share my thoughts on how to SEO develop a job interview. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, nice having a bit of a chat before we get stuck into it. Like we said, my name is Dylan Harbour I'm from Ringia, South Africa, and we're going to be talking about how to ace your developer job interview. Um, so first, uh, a bit about Ringia South Africa. Uh, we build the software that drives classified marketplaces. So if you're thinking about classified marketplaces, it's, it's your traditional ones of cars, jobs, property, um, where you can trade in those types of, of, um, of, business, of entities. And also the, the general classified marketplaces like horizontals, which can sell anything from electronics to spare tires to cell phones, anything in between. Um, we don't actually run any of these platforms, but we build the tech stack and, and the applications that do drive these platforms. And we specialize in, in rolling them out in emerging markets for the Ringier Group. Currently, we have quite a big footprint in East and West Africa and a growing footprint in Southeast Asia with the hopes and dreams of, of um, conquering more of Asia and Europe in the near future as well. So a few stats, we, we're sitting with over 40 developers. I think we might even be over 50 developers at the moment, closer to 60, but uh, definitely over 40 developers uh, with a remote first approach. So although most of us are based here in South Africa, we do have a few developers that are sitting in various other places around the world, and we collaborate quite heavily with international teams one of our main hubs, um, like we spoke about earlier, is in Mauritius, uh, where Matt Hood and the rest of the gang are all based and developing the property platforms for our emerging markets directly out of Mauritius. So it's really nice to be contributing to the Mauritius ecosystem here as well, because we're heavily invested and we love the Mauritius software development community. We love what you guys are doing and we love to see the initiatives like this conference are coming about in the Mauritius space. So, so far, just a few stats. This year to date, we've served over 30 million users in Africa alone. And uh, we, that was a couple of weeks ago. So that number has gone up quite a bit. And we, we, that's across more than 20 marketplaces from Africa and Asia. So if you'd like more info about that, head on over to international websites or our African websites or chat to any of the team if you do bump into them in any future events. But it would be good to share some, some more of our understanding of classified marketplaces with you guys in future as well. Um, here's a, a, just a, a quick team photo, uh, one, one that was shared with me from the beaches of Mauritius. I do hope to get my own photo like that sometime, like we spoke about, but that's, that's going to have to wait at least a year for us to get this human malware virus under, under control before we can really travel and, and um, spend some time with the team over in Mauritius. Perfect. Um, so a bit about myself. I am proudly South African. I'm proudly African as well. And I, I love to see how emerging markets and developing countries, including places like Mauritius, are starting to take more of a lead position in the tech space, stand up and be counted and not just wait for the European markets and the Asian markets and the American markets to tell us what to do, but we can actually stand up and be counted on, on, on our own two feet. Um, originally, I come from a back-end web development background. So I'm I'm a huge fan of PHP. I used PHP before the days of Laravel and stuff like that. But since Laravel has come about, I've, I've really invested in that ecosystem. And I do believe that it, it, is, it is worth investing in. It is something that is growing. Currently, I'm digging into the tall stack, which is Tailwind, Alpine.js, Laravel, and Livewire. Really interesting stuff that's happening there. And overall, it's just a, it's a great community to be part of. I highly encourage you to dig into that. This crazy photo on the right hand side was taken about 10 years ago, and that coincides with about the same time period when I had to sit and conduct my first job interview as a hiring manager. So some poor faces had to sit across from this face and try and convince me that they deserved a job position, that they had the skills that were required and that they could actually deliver on, on what the task was that we had to deliver on. Um, and I do feel sorry for them. That was a long time ago. I've lost a little bit of hair since then and grown a little bit more, but overall it's been a, a, a roller coaster last 10 years. 
Over those 10 years, I've had seasons of hiring and seasons of not hiring. So I've been in positions where I've had to sit through weeks and weeks of job interviews, and it felt like it was never ending. And then I've also had seasons where I've done no hiring. But every time I've gone back into the hiring processes, I've continuously been frustrated with the way that developers present themselves at that opportunity. Um, it just seems like they make your life a little bit more difficult than it needs to be. There's some really basic things that you you would hope that they would get right. And it just has been continuously frustrating. So that's pretty much where this talk came from. It came from an experience or continuous experiences of not being put in position to give people a job, despite having the budget, despite having the, the products that needed to be built and a desire to hire people. There has been some frustrations in the way that people have presented themselves. So this talk really aims to to answer that question on and, and guide developers in presenting themselves in the best possible light when they appear for jobs or when they apply for, for job interviews and, and try and make it easier for hiring managers to make that decision to give them the, the opportunity to prove themselves. So to make sure that I, I was not lying to you guys and got a little bit more input from a wider audience, I reached out to a few people in my network. So these these guys on the right hand side, Neil, Stephen, Matt and Merlin, thank you very much for letting me pick your brain and make sure that I wasn't going to present something that was inaccurate because together I think that the five of us represent quite a considerable amount of, of experience in, in sitting in that chair, trying to hire people, trying to offer people the position. Um, we've definitely got well over a thousand combined interviews behind us. I think some of these these guys might even have close to that number just by themselves. But definitely between us, we've got quite a few interviews that we've had to sit through, representing multiple industries, all forms of tech positions across uh, lots of different continents. I think there's between us, we've worked in Africa, Asia, and Europe, um, and lots of different countries within those spaces. So uh, it's it's definitely um, something that I, I do hope represents a wider view than just my own. I took the words that they gave me and I put it together in a talk like this, not necessarily directly. So I do hope I represent it accurately, but there's, there's a wealth of knowledge in, in those four faces over there. And I do think that we can definitely learn from the experiences that they've gone through. Overall, one of the commonalities that I found during this process is that in all of the, the conversations I had with the team, the frustrations were generally the same frustrations about getting back to basics, about the fundamentals that people don't present correctly when they, they apply for job interviews. And that process of, of just getting back to basics was common in, in all of them. It, there's, there's probably nothing new in this talk that you've never heard before. There's nothing that, that's revolutionary. There's nothing that people are going to write books about. This is really just getting the fundamentals right in the way that you present yourself for your career opportunities that come about as a developer. So before we dig into it, just one last tip or one last, one last point here. There's a few things that are out of scope of this talk. We've only got 45 minutes to dig into it. Um, and th these things are quite specific to the geographical location, your specific tech stack, and, and your environment or your ecosystem that you're operating in, your actual industry that you're operating in. So we're not going to be digging into too much detail on the stack specific tips on salary negotiations or on where to look for a job. If you have any questions about that or, or any suggestions, you're welcome to leave them in the YouTube chat and be someone will be able to help you within your industry or within your geographical locations, but this isn't really going to be a primary focus of our talk. Rather, what I'm going to be focusing in is these two areas. First of all, the five things that hiring managers fear. We're all people too. We do have our own fears. We do have our own things that we have to overcome, but uh, we, we're going to dig into those and see how we can overcome those five things that hiring managers fear, as well as an alternative checklist to complete before interviewing for a development job. Awesome. So let's get into it. Um, hiring managers have a responsibility to hire competent people that can deliver on the mandate that they've been given. Um, but before they can make any recommendations to extend an offer, um, most of them will have to overcome these five fears. So if you position yourself to help them overcome these fears, they will be more inclined to extend an offer to you and you'll be better positioned than the rest of the candidates to be first in line for that offer. So these fears are the sum of all the internal conversations that a hiring manager has with themselves before they would be willing to put their own neck on the line and recommend that you be hired. So the first fear that I've put down is 
will they upset the delicate balance that we've created? Now, I, I can almost feel the rolling eyes happening through the, the streams of internet that are coming at me here um, because this just sounds so abstract and ridiculous. Uh, we've got nice keywords like team player and culture fit and work ethic and values. And if you're anything like I was when I started down this road, you'd want to puke at this point um, because this is not the the stuff that developers thrive on. Developers like facts, they like technical solutions, they like frameworks, they like code. That, that's how developers communicate, that's what they like. They don't like things like culture fit. What is that even? Um, but I think the reason that I put this as the very first fear and the very first thing that people need to overcome when they, over, when they interview for a, a development position is because you have to recognize that during the process of applying for a job, most of the first rounds of interviews or most of the first rounds of filtering is done by a non-technical person. So generally, you've got someone like an HR person, a recruiter, some other back office people within a company, potentially some managers, or uh, you know, if, if it's a very small organization, maybe even the founder themselves is trying to find somebody to build this fancy product that he wants to build. And often those are not technical people. They are people that understand these types of things like organizations and culture fits and team player and work ethic. So they can immediately rule you out of any future rounds of interviews just by saying, hey, look, I don't think he's the right fit for us. And that may sound unfair, but this is the reality of how the processes work. And if you're not willing to ac accept that, you're going to put yourself in a worse position to follow through with the rest of the interview processes. So there's, there's a saying that one bad apple spoils the barrel. And I think that that also applies to developers and to, to tech teams, because if you've worked within an, any organizations for a certain amount of time, you probably have your own stories to tell of how one bad apple can spoil the barrel, of how one developer who comes with a bad attitude or is just the wrong fit or doesn't have the right work ethic or the right values can take the entire team down from being productive and being an effective team down to being ineffective and non-productive at what they do. So hiring managers are often trying to protect themselves from hiring those people and they really do care about the delicate balance that they've created within their team. So how do you actually overcome this? This is just my suggestions. Um, I would love to hear your, your own suggestions. You, you're welcome to leave them in YouTube thread and we can chat about them during the Q&A later on. But my suggestions is, first of all, show that you're a team player. If you come into an interview and you immediately say, I don't like working with other people, I want to work by myself, I don't play well with others, that's going to put you in a significantly worse position than somebody who comes with the story of actually being involved in teams and being accepting of working within a team space. Secondly, you can be a human, not a robot. You're allowed to have personality, you're allowed to have hobbies, you're allowed to have feelings. Keep in mind that this is, this is the personality, this is the, the, the story that you're presenting to somebody who might have to spend at least eight hours a day with you. And nobody really wants to work with somebody who has a terrible personality or no personality for eight hours a day that can be incredibly frustrating and can, can be upsetting to the way that you engage with people. So you're allowed to bring that human element into the process. You're allowed to actually have those feelings. You're allowed to have hobbies. You're allowed to have a bit of personality and not just worry about the binary facts of code and, and tech stack. Next up, humility is greater than arrogance. I have never sat in a job interview with somebody who thought they knew more than everybody else in the room and at the end of it decided, cool, I definitely want to hire that person. It's an immediate turnoff. It's something that can come across really badly. And there's a huge difference between being confident in what you do know and being arrogant um, to everybody that's in the room with you. So keep that in mind. Um, you can still come across with confidence. You can still have something to say about an answer, about a de decision, about a direction. But if you're going to bring arrogance into that process, th there's generally going to be bad vibe and hiring managers are going to not want to hire you for that. 
Next up is to know your audience. There is significant differences in different industries. If you're in a corporate space or a startup space, um, what the values are of that organization, if they're huge fans of open source code, if they, you know, what, what they, how they choose to run their teams. And if you can just do a little bit of homework in knowing your audience, you can pitch towards them in a way that will convince them that you won't upset the balance that they have within their organization. Next up is to learn to communicate. Now, now this is a tricky one because developers are also not known for communication. Um, we are generally speaking the language of pull requests and code, and we like to troll each other on Slack, um, but that doesn't necessarily form part of, of the basics of what type of communication you need to have to be able to function within a team space and to be able to get the job done. Even if you're the only developer on a project, there's a good chance that you're still going to have to communicate with product managers, project managers, clients, QA resources. And uh, having that ability to communicate, showing that you have that ability to communicate will go a long way. This might not come naturally, especially if you're very young in the industry, and it might be something that you actually have to work on. But just put some time in, practice, try find resources that can help your communication process, and try and become more confident in the material that you're presenting so that your communication of that material is more succinct and more well represented in the way that it comes across. Lastly, in um, how to convince somebody that you're not going to upset the delicate balance of an organization is to actually show some interest in the company or the product. This is something that some developers actually don't believe is a requirement. And some developers think, hey, look, I'm here to write code. Why should I actually care what the product is? What, why should I care what the company values are? But like I said before, you've got these roadblocks that you're going to have to go through during the development process that are often manned by people that are not technically focused. And their responsibility is to protect the company from interests that are not benefiting the company. So you need to show a bit of interest in the company and in the product, ask some questions, do a little bit of homework, and keep in mind that, that interviews are a two-way street. So this is your opportunity to also find out if the company is a good match for you. You can find out if, if they match your own values, if, if they are an organization that isn't going to abuse you with ridiculous work requirements and project requirements. Um, you can go through that process of also interviewing them during this process by asking some questions and showing some interest in the company and the product. Believe it or not, you can be rejected before you even get to present yourself. Technically, you can be rejected from a first round of interviews by just not being interested in the company and the product enough for them to have confidence in pushing you through to the next round of interviews. Perfect. So that sums up fear number one and how to overcome it. Let's dig into fear number two. Can they continue to learn and grow? Now, again, if you've got a bit of gray hair like me, you've been around for a while, uh, you'll probably have stories to tell. I mean, I heard the stories earlier on about Commodore 64s um, and from back in the day. And, and, and that really, I mean, that's maybe a little bit just before my time. But the, the reality is that, that the tools that you're building with today are not the tools that that existed two or three years ago and likewise the tools that you're going to be building within two or three years are not the tools that you're learning right now technology is is changing super fast we're in one of the most fast moving industries in the world and you have to be able to keep up so hiring managers responsibility is is not only to hire somebody who can do the job today but also to hire somebody that has the ability to grow into what is required to do the job in 12 months time, in 24 months time, in five years time. And you need to overcome this fear before they would be willing to give you the opportunity to work for them. So how do you overcome that? First up, I recommend developing a track record of continuous learning. If you don't have a, a track record that shows that you have the ability to keep learning, you will battle to try and convince someone that you have the ability to continue learning. How can that look? It could be in, in doing courses, in playing with new frameworks, in contributing to open source code, just showing that you actually are engaged in actively continuing to learn and grow and develop your career as a developer. Next up, engage in your developer community. This A and B kind of go together in a way because 
if you are continuously learning, you're going to be doing it through engaging with your development community. You're going to be doing it with your tribe. You're going to be doing it with the, within the space and the resources that exist within, within your community. One of my favorite job interview questions when I'm interviewing candidates is to ask them how they go about learning new technologies. And very often, most candidates can come up with an answer to that question. It's, it's not a very difficult one. So for example, they might say, I do courses on Udemy. And I'll immediately follow that up with something like, give me an example of something that you recently learned on Udemy. And you can immediately see the difference between candidates who actually or candidates who think that they have this attitude of continuously learning versus candidates who actually do have that attitude of continuously learning. So, so they, if, if, you, if you have a candidate who isn't able to give you a, a decent answer to an example of something that they've recently learned off of Udemy, then there's a good chance that they actually haven't logged in to Udemy in the last six weeks at all, and they haven't actually been engaging with anything. Um, so it, it does separate quite quickly the people into two different groups on those that think that they do have this attitude and those that actually do have that attitude. On engaging with your, your developer community, there's so many different ways to do it. You can contribute to open source projects. You can uh, speak at local meetups. You can just attend the local meetups or, or, or start them if they don't exist yet. But really just to show that you you have that yearning, that, that desire to um, engage with the community and grow as a developer. All of those kind of sum up into the word passion and, and showing that you have a passion for what you're doing rather than just a desire to get a paycheck and a desire for a job. Now, in all of the hiring managers that I, I chatted to earlier, they all said that this passion is something that you can you can identify quickly it's something that you you can see in somebody when you when you're conversing with them when you start to when you start to um chat to them about what they're actually doing and and passion is a bit of a strange thing because it's 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 kind of like being funny you can't tell somebody that you are funny you you can tell them a joke and by telling them a joke they will know that you are funny but by just saying i'm a funny guy you're not actually going to convince them that you're a funny guy. So passion is very similar. You can't just say to them, oh, I'm passionate about being a developer. It means nothing. It doesn't have any weight. But if your career is developed around showing that you have that passion in engaging with the community and continuously learning, you will be able to, to convince them that you do have that passion. And if you have that passion, they're going to be a lot more interested in trying to get you on their team. So that sums up number two. Let's move on to number three. Can they get the job done? Now, personally, this is my number one fear when I'm hiring people. There's nothing worse than working in a team of people that are always busy, but nothing ever gets done. And our product manager in Mauritius, he always says, you need to not only do the first 99% of a task, but you need to do the next 99% as well. And it's so true because there's a big difference between having the first 99% done and getting it almost there versus actually getting it over the line. So how do you prove that you have that ability to get something over the line? Um, these are my suggestions. Again, I'm, I'm keen to hear what you have to say about this. But first of all, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you have a finished product to show in your portfolio. Now, that could be in the form of a a portfolio product or pro project that, that you've worked on at previous employment. But personally, when people show me that, it's nice. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. I'll ask some questions. But it doesn't really carry any weight. Because if you've been working in a team of five developers and you managed to get an amazing Android app launched, I don't actually know if you were the developer that got it over the finish line or if the other four developers were the ones that got it over the finish line. So it carries a lot more weight to me if you have your own personal project, your own personal product that you've managed to build and deploy and put somewhere and show that it is finished and show that it is at a skill level that you can that can represent um, what you have to show or what you have to offer for to an organization. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be a great idea even. It just has to be finished and it has to represent your skill level of what you have to offer. The next one, a personal peeve for myself, I really get frustrated when people just list all the skills in the world on a resume, um, something that they might, click, might have clicked a button once on, 
on AWS, so they call themselves an AWS or they give themselves an AWS skill. That that type of thinking is going to count against you in the long run. Just throwing lots of words in there isn't going to help because it's going to dilute from the skills that you might actually have. So rather focus on the skills that you do have and where you have skills that, that don't have an equal weighting, have a, a clear skills matrix that shows where your skill level is for each of the different um, skills that you put down on a resume. Next up, uh, make some code public. Um, if you can do A and C at the same time, that's a double win. Um, that's something that's really going to count towards uh, towards uh, people being more confident in, in what your ability is, um, in having not just the product to show, but in actually being able to show the code of how that product works. So put some, put some code on your repo, um, on your GitHub profile, make sure that you have something that's public. Um, and if you don't have anything to build, that's completely fine. Find an open source project, contribute to that, help test, help with issues and, and, and try and, and contribute through those processes to open source projects to try and represent your understanding of how these technologies work accurately through code examples. Next up is to be prepared for technical assessments. I know this is another contentious one because they can be huge time wasters for developers who are applying at lots of different companies all over the place. Uh, but the reality is that these checks and balances have to exist for organizations to have the confidence in you to go through that, that offer process. And if they don't have enough confidence in you or if they have certain checks that they have to just fulfill, unfortunately, it's just part of playing the game. I would recommend that the, that that you do A, B, and C first, because if you can get especially A and C right, you have less chance of 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 wasting your time with technical assessments that aren't going to end in a successful offer. Um, but if you have already accurately represented your competency, then any reasonable hiring manager is not going to waste their time getting you to do additional technical assessments. But unfortunately, technical assessments do exist. We're in a technical space, and this is one of the best places to to um, to try and and test for the skills that we need. So I'm not a huge fan of of the old school whiteboard assessments, giving you a a crazy loop to try and figure out on a whiteboard. I think that's a complete waste of time. But like I said before, you've got lots of different players during the interview process. You might get an old school senior developer who sees that as being valuable. And that's their little party trick that they like to do. And maybe you're just going to have to jump through that hoop. But don't, don't be offended by technical assessments when they do come up. Rather, embrace them, be ready for them, and do your best when they do come up and try and get them done as quickly as possible and to the best of your ability. Also, make sure that you, if you do get a take-home assessment, get it done or don't hand it in because doing a take-home assessment and then not getting it finished is not useful in, in showing your ability to get something over the, over the finish line. I've heard a, a, quite a few stories recently, especially during this, this global pandemic where a lot of the interviews are happening more remotely. I've heard lots of stories of guys um, or girls phoning in to a job interview and then suddenly they're asked to share their screen, check out a repo and start coding or correcting a bug or, or, or explaining some code to the person on the other end. I, I don't know if that's fair as well. Personally, I've, I've never asked anyone to do that, but these things are happening. So be ready for them. Make sure that your screens are cleared. Make sure that your Slack is closed. Um, make sure that you, you're in a, in a position to be able to respond to whatever's coming your way for technical assessments so that um, you can be best prepped to, um, to, to give a good response when the questions are asked. Uh, next up is to be responsible for your own upskilling. This sounds self-explanatory, but I, I think that there, there are a lot of people that have that have a, a mindset that it's the responsibility of a, an organization or a company to teach you everything that you need to do a job. In our industry, in our day and age, I don't think that that's the reality. You can take pretty much any topic that you want to learn, and you can learn that almost for free or for very little money through the online learning platforms that exist, through the communities that exist, through YouTube tutorials and things like that. So take that on yourself. And make sure that if you're going to apply for a job, for example, we do a lot of Laravel developments. We're a, a big fan of PHP and Laravel. And if you apply for a job with us as a Laravel development job, but you have never started or, or created a Laravel application, I'm not going to be interested in giving you a job because 
There's nothing stopping you from doing that on your own time before you even apply for the job. And if we're looking specifically for Laravel developers, even if your skills from Symfony and all the rest will transfer, that's completely acceptable. Acceptable, But you do actually have to put a little bit in from your side as well and make sure that you have a bit of an understanding of what you're getting yourself into and take that responsibility on for your own upskilling. Lastly, to try and overcome the challenge of can they get the job done? there is the question of certifications and qualifications. And again, this is going to be very different for different industries, for different job levels, for different locations. I know that in some countries that we've operated in, qualifications are viewed very, very highly and very respected. And in other places that I've seen, qualifications are like, you know, gets you in the door, but it it doesn't really count for anything. So you need to kind of weigh that up yourself. I know that there are a lot more certification programs out there these days. Some of them are more formal, like the the AWS certifications or the Laravel developer certifications. And some of them are a little bit more informal with some of the online learning platforms where you can just do courses and do tests and get some type of certification for that. This may or may not count, um, count in your favor, but I think it never hurts to just investigate what is out there for certifications and qualifications in your specific industry and with your specific stack and try and use that to back up and uh, back up your position and convince them that you actually have the ability to get the job done that they are looking for. Fear number four, are they worth the salary? Now, like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to dig into salary negotiations all that much, um, but this is a legitimate fear that hiring managers have. You don't want to hire somebody for a certain amount of money and then find out that you could have gotten a better developer for less money later on. It's the same as if you're going to buy a product. If it ends up being on sale the next week, you're going to be super, super sad um, and not like developers are products, but it's a very big fear in whether the, the salary that people are expecting is a realistic and a reasonable salary to pay. So just a few quick points. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but be realistic about your skill level. Don't oversell yourself. I don't believe in the, the fake it till you make it type of mantra, because especially in the development space, I think there's no excuse for you to not just learn the skills that you need to at, the, at a certain level. Um, and then back yourself up in in that with with real skills without actually having to fake it. The next one is to know your salary ranges in your industry and location. Try and do a bit of homework, chat to some recruiters, chat to other people in the industry and and get a, a grasp of it. Discuss growth opportunities during the interview process and then also consider the total package. So don't just focus on the monetary value, but also look at other things, other benefits, um, other perks that might come with it, and try and consider the total package that comes with an, with an offer from an organization. Lastly, this is my last fear that I personally have and that I think a lot of other hiring managers have, is will they ride the storms or just jump ship? Any organization, any team, any development product will go through highs and go through lows. And there's nothing worse than when you're going through a low, you you lose some developers. And it has happened. I think most people with a bit of gray hair probably got that gray hair from doing things like that. But it does happen. And it's something that you want to protect yourself from and be a little bit defensive on when you are hiring new people. So you're looking for people that have a little bit more of a long-term view within an organization Generally, it takes a couple of weeks, it takes a couple of months in some cases to really onboard people properly, get them familiar with the product, get them familiar with the workflow, get them familiar with the tech stack before you'll actually get productivity. And if you're continuously changing people all the time, it it doesn't really help to, to increase productivity and keep good development team health. Um, so it's, it's also a good question on the flip side if you're being interviewed to ask how long the rest of the team have been around, because this can also be a good indicator on what the rest of the team is like and and how long they've been part of the organization. Um, But this is definitely a fear that you're going to have to overcome before a hiring manager will be willing to give you an offer. So how do you overcome that fear? Um, Again, keen to hear your tips. These are my suggestions. First of all, don't jump around jobs too often. It never looks good when um, somebody has been, at multiple jobs in in a very short time um, because you have to start asking questions on on uh, why they left those jobs and if they will actually stay with us if we choose to hire them and if we choose to invest in them and train them up and get them onboarded successfully 
If you do end up leaving, I know companies shut down. I know this pandemic has hit a lot of industries and a lot of companies. I think for the most part, our industry has been quite well shielded compared to the more non-digital spaces. But uh, if you do end up leaving companies, just put a short reason on your resume, just a one-liner on what, why you left, and that might uh, just avoid some some awkward conversations that might come up um, if you if you don't have any justification for that. Perfect. So those are my five fears that uh, you need to overcome, five fears that hiring managers have. I'm going to go through through 10 very quick things through a checklist. And a lot of this is repetition of what we've already gone through. Um, but as I go through this, you can kind of internalize this, think about it, and see how you fare on your the way that you're portraying your career and your profile to potential hiring managers. So first up, check your online profile, LinkedIn, GitHub, Stack Overflow, any Stack-specific communities, Facebook, all of those bits and pieces. Those spaces, they can be a little bit contentious. So for example, LinkedIn, I know developers hate, um, and, and personally, I'm not a huge fan of it myself, but some HR people will not be very impressed if you don't have a LinkedIn profile um, because they want to see your connections. They want to see your career history on LinkedIn. Maybe if, if you just want to play the game, then just activate a LinkedIn profile while you're looking for a job or going through to some interviews. You don't have to keep it on, on the, the whole time. GitHub, really important one, I think, for developers. That is our primary community, it seems, between GitHub and Stack Overflow and all of those spaces. But check your online profile and try and get an external perspective of looking at how your online profile looks to somebody who might be Googling around for you and seeing what they find. There's a new trend that is coming, uh, or it's basically already here with a lot of companies. If you're familiar with something called an ATS, an applicant tracking system, there is a trend where ATSs are being built that include a lot of machine learning and AI algorithms that pull together all of your online profiles and all of your, your online places and present them together with your resume and try and use machine learning to filter out candidates immediately without any human having to be involved. So that's going to be an interesting place to watch. There might be some little nuances that you pick up if you start to apply through ATSs, especially those that have machine learning that's backing it, um, because you may never actually get your profile to a human, it may be rejected immediately by a computer or by some, some person's algorithm. Whether that's fair or not is a whole nother question, but just keep in mind that all of these things are happening within the industry and you can Google around for it. I can share some links of, of some good articles that dig into that. But generally, it's, it's just something that you need to be aware of and you need, to, uh, you need to be cognizant of. Next up, we're going to go through these very quickly. I, I am aware of the time. Identify and engage with your tribe. Um, I think we've gotten into that already. Mock interviews. So have five to ten interviews from a variety of people. Update your resume. So keep it short to the point. Follow traditional templates. Add a detailed skills matrix include short reasons for leaving. We've covered the ATSs already. Always be ready for technical interviews. Number six, include a finished product or project. We've already covered that, but keep that on your checklist. Number seven, do you know your audience? Um, so research the company, research the products and research the competitors. Number eight, don't be late. That's self-explanatory and the pun or the rhyming was not intentional. Number nine, investigate certifications. We've already covered that. And number 10, overcome their fears. So take your own profile, look at it against the fears that I presented already, weigh it up and, and see if you've done enough to overcome the fears that, that hiring managers might have um, in, in, before they can, they can offer you a position. So that's it from me. Hopefully short and sweet. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. I'm not very active on Twitter, but you're welcome to send me some messages and, and uh, share your thoughts with me on there. Emails there as well if you want to reach out to me at all. But if you have any questions, let's shoot. Yeah, let's shoot. I mean, thank you so much for this strong overview and strong arguments during the interview process. I have to say... Your fear number three, everything that was mentioned, that came really like 
you were reading out of my heart because these are the bullet points and aspects that we are kind of preaching <laughs> within the community, you know. Be engaged, show that you are passionate, um, code, assist in community projects, um, check out open source and bits and pieces. I mean, be realistic and, and go forward with that. And also the part in regards for certification and qualifications is actually that I spoke about that topic yesterday uh, as the last session in the Bat Cave. So I'm, I'm really... Uh, what you mentioned was really speaking to me. Aditya, what's going on on your side? A really good question. I'm sure that you have helped lots of people here for the next job interviews. And actually, we have one question from YouTube chat, and it's from Percy. So his question is, do you think that a GitHub account and contribution to open source is a requirement to get hired as a developer nowadays? Uh, I think it depends quite a lot on what the organization is and what their tech stack is. If if you're working like we do with with a lot of open source code, GitHub is is a requirement because it shows that you have, first of all, the ability to work on GitHub. That's a big one because it immediately shows that we're not going to have to teach you how version control works and specifically how GitHub version control works. So that's, that's a, a big point in your favor already. The second one is that open source it really needs to be part of, of who the person is, if they do believe it or if they don't believe in it, um, and if they are contributing towards those processes. And the best way to prove that is with a GitHub account. Um, so I think it's, it's a, I would consider it for our organization, I would consider it almost mandatory that people have experience, especially if they coming in as intermediates or senior developers, maybe we can be a little bit more lenient with juniors. But if you're coming in acting like you know what you're doing, you, you should have en engaged in those community spaces already. And I would consider it to be mandatory. Absolutely Thank right. You. And I mean, GitHub, yeah. GitHub also gives you um, the tools that you can have your personal portfolio website on there free of charge with hosting and build it up. I mean, this already is not only you get a free account, you get a free online presence. And I think this is a very good uh, business card uh, for your professional career. I have another question in regards to what you mentioned about the job jumping situation, because I am partially under the impression that this is eventually a serious problem here in Mauritius because in the past I had it that according to certain resumes from applicants it's like they make it a must to change company every 11 months and for me personally that's a no-go for my business but how do you see that how would what is your advice for for this kind of scenario I think that it's a bad attitude to get into because most of the, the more fruitful years that I've had within organizations have not been within the first 12 months. They've been in the second or the third year. Once you've really stabilized, you've understood the dynamics of the teams, you've understood the tech stack, and you've got into a position where you can actually add weight to your arguments that you present. Mm -hmm. I think also what, what does count, yeah, well, something that, that people could maybe substitute jumping with is trying to find growth within the same organization. So try and place yourself in a position where you're staying within the same team, but there's a career opportunity, a career progression for you to be able to advance your mm -hmm. career without having to move companies, because that will give you the boost of advancing your career and potentially getting some movement through the the, the ladder, if you put it that way, um, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to move companies to get that. If you're in a position where you're stuck, if you're not growing, then definitely don't let this be a reason to stay in a bad organization, but just be cognizant of it and be careful about jumping too often. I mean, the reasons in that case was actually very, how would I say, profane, banal, uh, because it was simply they, the reason to jump company was that this way they can actually get a raise easier than negotiating with their HR department because literally like, you know, jumping from company to company, they got a raise of about $150 or about four or 5,000 rupees compared to, you know, negotiating with your HR department. So I, I'm not sure because I mean, you as a company, you are investing into them in, that you grow together, as you just said. And, uh, to my opinion, it should not come down to something 
as simple as just a salary. Definitely. All right, Dylan. One yeah, more question yeah. in the chat. Pick it, just pick it. Okay. So it's Elias from YouTube, and he or she wants to know what's your opinion on overstaying in a company compared to job jumping. So yeah, I think it, we, we've spoken a little bit around that already, um, but I would try and position myself more for growth within a, a company um, and try and be, just have frank conversations with the people around you. Um, I think we're if you're if you're in an organization that is worth staying in, those conversations should be easy to have. It might not be something that comes up every month, but it, it should be something that that you can have on some type of regular basis and rather try and, and, and figure out a growth opportunity within your current organization before looking externally. All right. Okay, cool. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Dylan, thank you so much for your time. It was really very informative. I see the comments as well on the live chat. We're looking forward to meet with you when the borders are open, that we might Definitely. sit together for a cocktail or for a cold beer, depending on your personal preference. With that, again, thank you as well to Ringia as a to be a partner of the conference uh, to support the community to see that you are putting so much emphasis on community activities and really looking forward to to welcome you at one of our future events hopefully next year's conference again and with that have a great time and enjoy the rest of the sessions please thank you very much and thanks for having me 